So the challenge is twofold. One, you got to be true to yourself. Yeah. You don't ever ask somebody else's permission mm -hmm. to what your calling is. <laughs> Never. Be true to yourself. <laughs> don't even ask your mama. That's like asking your mama whether you have permission to love somebody. Mm. You love your mama to death, but you don't ask for her permission. You ask for her consultation. Mama, I'd like to let you know that I'm in love. What you think about it? <laughs> Not do I have your permission? No, I raised you well enough. You're a free man now. You better choose, and you're going to pay with the consequences if you don't get it right. Mm -hmm. But that's true for your calling, too. But the second thing is that cry of affliction still needs to be heard. What is the impact of the cry of affliction on your calling writing that dissertation? It doesn't have to have some immediate connection, but is that cry in any way informing what you're thinking about, what you're writing about, how you plan to live and bear witness? It, it's a complicated relation, but there ought to be some relation. Mm -hmm. You don't want to act as if that cry is not being put forward. And that's the reason why in that piece, I talk about the two greatest intellectual traditions that black people themselves beneath modernity and under American democracy created, which is the black musical tradition and the black homiletical tradition. Mm -hmm. And what's distinctive about those traditions was that they didn't have to worry about the white normative gaze as to what the white standards were in order to be measured. They didn't have to be picked out by white elites and said, you are good and you are not good and so forth. We had our own internal standards of excellence. So when the Beat magazine said, John Coltrane, you don't know how to play the saxophone because you're playing too fast and giant steps, he could just laugh. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, that's what you think? Just keep doing what he's doing. <laughs> Philadelphia, Coltrane. You see? Well, if a preacher said, oh, you know, uh, 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 Reverend Gardner Taylor, we think you really should take some notes up when you, uh, when you give your sermon. Because it looks like to me that your, 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 your language just becomes so rich and, and so multidimensional and so deep that, that, that people might get lost in it. Maybe you just need a piece of paper with some white, black print on it. And God and got so much love in his heart, and he said, well, I'll, I'll pray on that one. <laughs> and just walk right up and just start preaching with no notes again. Mm -hmm. The reason is self-confidence, mm -hmm. a self-respect, a self-affirmation. It doesn't have to measure oneself against others. It doesn't have to put them down. It doesn't have to put them up. They're not a major point of reference. You just learn from them and keep doing what you're doing in light of your own tradition. That's what black preachers been doing. That's what the black musicians been doing. You see? And that, and what has that done? Now you see, it's no accident then that within the black community, the black musicians are what? They're loved. Because it's clear that they contribute to the healing and the vision. So if somebody asks you, what do you want to be? I want to be like Luther Vandross. Go on and sing, brother. Because <laughs> you probably ain't going to be like Luther, but if you want to, that's good. <laughs> because nobody denies the contributions of the Luther Vandrosses mm -hmm. in terms of enriching and empowering not just black people and others, but especially black people in this. Gerald Levert, we can go on and on and on. Same is true for the preachers. Same is true for the preachers. What are you doing? Preaching, oh, you're not one of those gangster preachers. No, no, I'm trying to be true to the word. Ah, I'm, 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 I'm come, come check you out on Sunday. Come on, get, sit on the front row. Give it all you got. And you say, you know, you might only have nine people in your church, <laughs> but you're doing a good work. Because hmm. if you affecting one precious, priceless human being, yeah. that's a beautiful thing. Amen. A beautiful thing. You've given it your own. You see? Here come intellectuals. How do intellectuals learn from the best of the musicians and the best of the preachers so that our work in the life of the mind, our work in the world of ideas, can be respected owing to the fact that it has that kind of healing impact? It has that kind of insight-providing activity. It has that kind of 
opening and awakening people to see and think things that heretofore they would not have seen or thought. And all of a sudden, the life of the mind becomes empowering and ennobling and enabling the way in which our musicians are, in their own distinctive way, en enriching and enabling and ennobling in the way the best of our preachers have been historically enriching, ennobling, and enabling. So it's from the very beginning, first just as a Christian, uh, I always viewed the measure of what I do with what I bring. Mm -hmm. What's the quality of the love in it? What's the depth of the service in it? Sometimes it takes an academic form because the academic public is very important. There's not just one public. There's a lot of different publics. There's an academic public. There's an ecclesiastical public. There's a larger religious public. There's a youth public, most of them unchurched, unsynagogued, and untempled, far removed from any religious ritual. That's why the Never Forget the CD with Prince and Gerald LaVert and Talib Kweli and Raw Digger and Jill Scott and all of them on the album because I'm trying to present a danceable education because they're not getting to the textual education. They're not reading the text. But they listen to the music, it's the same paideia, Christian paideia at work. Mm. That shift from bling bling to quest for wisdom linked to the cross, you see. But it's, you know, it's always uneven. Mm. It's always uneven because you end up being multi-contextual in terms of being in the academy, in the churches. I spend good time in synagogues with Jewish brothers and sisters as well as in the mosques with Islamic brothers and sisters, with the trade union folk. Try to do some television things every once in a while when Bill Maher and uh, Colbert and others uh, are kind enough to have me on. Uh, and, of course, most importantly for me is the, uh, the young people, because I've shifted. Um, I think when, when Sister Rosie and I met almost 10 years ago, I was spending much more time in colleges, but now I spend more time in high schools and junior high. Just relate very early very, very early on, so you can try to have the paideia early on to get them shifting, so they don't get seduced by the superficial so quick. Yeah. And all you do is just plant a seed, right? just like the sower, right? The sower is not a farmer, it's a sower. You plant the seed, keep moving. You ain't gonna be able to cultivate the plant, no, 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 just planting the seed. You're planting the seed, it's gonna be dead and gone pretty soon anyway. Dr. West, our time is up. You have been so generous with your time. And I, amen. Brother, you were wonderful, man.